Well, welcome to chapter 28 of the book of Jeremiah. This is, again, a continuation of the conversation in 27 that, uh, that they've been having this disputation between Jeremiah and the false prophets. He's in front of the king, Zedekiah, saying, look, guys, this is going to turn bad. You need to repent and go with Babylon. This is important. So watch chapter 27 to go through the notes and ideas of that chapter. This is a continuation. Now, if you remember, we talked about chapter 27, verse 1, should probably be taken out of the, the Bible. I mean, it's okay to leave it there, but it's it doesn't need to be there. It's a scribal edition that's confusing it. So if we look at chapter 28, we're going to see this idea of it's not Jehoiakim as king, it's Zedekiah as king. So verse 1, it says, And it came to pass the same year in the beginning of the reign of King Zedekiah of Judah, in the fourth year and in the fifth month, that Hananiah, the son of Azur the prophet, which was of Gibeon, spake unto me, in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests of all the people, saying, so let's talk about this. So this is the fourth year of Zedekiah's reign. So this is still early. This is the same. Remember, we're in the house of Zedekiah. We're in the palace. Jeremiah is telling him, stop listening to the false prophets. The Hananiah is one of those false prophets. So now Hananiah is going to rebut what Jeremiah had just said in the last chapter. So now this chapter is Hananiah's perspective coming out, and then what happens after that. So the beauty of this chapter is we're going to see a contrast between a false prophet and a good prophet. We're going to see a contrast of these two, which is going to help us to think about what do we need to look for in looking about who is a false prophet and who is a true prophet of God. So we're going to, this is going to be kind of a, another little lesson we get in here too. So this is Hananiah saying, verse 2, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. So Hananiah is telling them, guys, God told me this is what's going to happen. He has broken the, the yoke of Babylon. He is going to return us to power. So Jeremiah and Hananiah are both saying, God told me this. So we can't take them at face value to evaluate the difference between the two. It's hard to see because they're both claiming prophetic revelation. So that's a, that we just have to cancel that out. We can't use that to determine is he a true prophet or not because they're both saying the same thing. So what we can do is see which one comes to pass. And we're going to see that here because Hanani is going to say, and this, this happens a lot, okay, whenever a person says, I'm going to put a stake in the ground. I'm going to put a timeline here on this year and this date. This is going to happen. You'll have an opportunity to judge. This is a, it's not, you know, prophets sometimes do put a stake in the ground and say, here's where it is. But usually those are conditional. If you do not repent, this is what's going to happen. But it doesn't say you don't have to, you know, if you don't repent by March 27th at 3.30 p.m. or whatever, you know, that, they don't necessarily say that. They, they talk more in a pattern. If you repent, this isn't going to happen. If you don't repent, this will happen. Well, I'm not telling you the timing of it, but this will happen. So telling you the patterns. Well, Hananiah is going to put a stake in the ground. That means we can now measure if he's true or not. So verse 3, he says, Within two full years will I bring again into this, this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried them to Babylon. Now verse 4, And I will bring again to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah that went into Babylon, saith the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. So this is what's going on. That's what Hananiah said. Now, Interesting thing about Hananiah. Let's talk about this, this guy for a second. We'll kind of understand who he is. We know more about Jeremiah, but let's talk about Hananiah for a second here. Hananiah was from Gibeon, which is in Benjamin, which is just above Jerusalem. So it's a little town about six miles northwest of Jerusalem, identified with the modern El Jib. So if you want to see where this is, look up El Jib. That's about where Hananiah came from in this world, basically around five we're probably sitting around 594 BC, probably right around there. 
Uh, so the Book of Mormon group, Lehi's family, they're gone. They're wandering through the desert right now, basically, on their way to the, to the land of Bountiful, when all this is happening in Jerusalem. So it says, the ancient site has been excavated in recent years. It had a number of important historical associations. The Gibeonites had deceived the Israelites in Joshua's day, Joshua 9. It was the scene of a contest between Saul's men and David's men, 2 Samuel 20. Here, Joab killed Amasa, 2 Samuel 20 as well. Hananiah's name means Yahweh has been gracious. It was an appropriate name for a prophet who believed strongly, if mistakenly, that Judah's fortunes would soon be restored. So other than, other than this story of what we understand about Hananiah, we don't know much else about him. So that's, his, that's what, what we know, basically. Uh, so now, when we look at this, this is, so Hananiah has put the stake in the ground. Within two years, all the vessels are coming back, and Jeconiah is coming back as well. So there seems to be a part of the population that believes that Jeho Jehoiachin, this is not Jehoiahaz, I think I said that wrong in the last chapter, Jehoiachin, Jehoiakim's son, who's been taken captive, he's coming back. There's a whole group of people that really want him to come back. They see him as the true king. Zedekiah is the puppet king, basically, that Babylon put in place. And so Zedekiah definitely has a complex. He has a hard time. He, has, he wants the people to love him and to believe in him, but he's seen as the Babylonian puppet. And so he's probably going along with some of these schemes because he wants them to believe that he is, he is like them. He is a nationalist who wants to build the pride of his, his nation up. Um, but they want him back. They want Jehoiachin back as the ruler, basically. Now, what's interesting is this exiled king, Jehoiachin, who's in Babylonian exile, in the book of Matthew, we learn that it's because of his exile that the while the throne of David ends about this time with Zedekiah. Zedekiah was the last king of a descendant of David to be the king of Israel. But the bloodline survived because of Jehoiah Chin. And Matthew in the genealogy of Christ points this out in the beginning of the book of Matthew. So that helps fulfill prophecy for the New Testament when Christ comes. And we're going to talk more about that when we get in the Old in New Testament as well. Uh, so that's there. So there's people at this day and age that are believing that Jehoiachin is the rightful king and needs to come back. So the prophets, these false prophets, are telling the people this that he will come back. Now, verse five is Jeremiah's now turn to respond to what Hananiah has said. Verse five, he says, "Then the prophet Jeremiah said unto the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests, and in the presence of all the people that stood in the house of the Lord." Even the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. The Lord do so. The Lord perform thy works which thou hast prophesied, to bring again the vessels of the Lord's house and all that is carried away captive from Babylon into this place. Now this may sound strange, like, wait a minute here. Why isn't Jeremiah opposing Hananiah? Basically, Jeremiah is agreeing with Hananiah by saying, Amen. He agrees with what Hananiah said. Now, it doesn't mean he, he agrees that God told Hananiah that he was broken the yoke of Babylon and within two years it'll all be hunky-dory and fine. What he's agreeing with is, I would love to see that come to fruition. I would, that's what I would love to have, is that to happen. But that's not what's going to happen. But we'll see what really goes on here. So... Jeremiah likes what Hananiah said. He hopes that would come true, but he knows that's not what's really going to happen. Uh, the Old Testament study manual says in verse 6, Jeremiah's amen, the Lord do so, is sarcastic. A challenge to see whose prophecies would be fulfilled. Moses taught that one test of a true prophet is whether his words come to pass. That's Deuteronomy 18.22. Jeremiah had prophesied destruction and captivity. Hananiah, return and restoration. Jeremiah's response was simply that the prophet whose words come to pass is the one chosen by the Lord. So realize this is one of the indications is let's have some patience and let's see if your prophecies come true. If they do, 
that maybe you are a prophet of God. If they don't, then maybe you're probably not a prophet of God. So waiting and just seeing if they happen or not is one way that we can evaluate if they're a true prophet or not. Now verse 7, this is Jeremiah going on, and he's going to say, Nevertheless, so I like what you said, Hananiah, and I really hope that happens, but hear now, hear thou now this word that I speak in thine ears and in the ears of all the people. Verse 8, the prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesied both against many countries and against great kingdoms of war and of evil and of pestilence. So again, one sign of a true prophet is he will not contradict the words of many past true prophets. So you can use the prophecies of past prophets as a check and a balance to say, if the current prophet contradicts what they said, then it's He's a probably a false prophet. If he doesn't contradict them, then he could be a true prophet. So that's he's that's what Jeremiah is saying here is there's been lots of prophets that have prophesied basically against these countries, against great kingdoms of war and of evil and of pestilence. So that's this is now another sign again. Does Jeremiah's prophecies line up with what the past has said? We learned in the in the last chapter or chapter 26 that yes, it does. So verse 9, the prophet which prophesieth of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. So again, one way to know if a prophet's true, test their word, see if it comes to pass. The problem with this test is it's what we would call in the business world a lagging indicator. This is, by the time you realize that's a true prophet or not, whatever he prophesied is either coming to pass or it's not. If he's prophesied destruction and you decide, well, let's just wait and see if the destruction comes, it's kind of too late. So it does work as a test, but it's not a perfect test to know who's a true prophet or not, basically. But that's what he's saying in here. Shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him? So that's what Jeremiah says. Well, I hope what you said comes true, Hananiah, but let's just wait and see. We've got two years. Let's wait and see which one of us is right. So now verse 10, Hananiah is doubling down. Then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke from off the prophet Jeremiah's neck and break it. So he walks over to Jeremiah, pulls the yoke off, smashes it, breaks it down basically. So Hananiah is offended that Jeremiah has spoken against him. Only the guilty get offended. I always remember that. Jeremiah was not offended at Hananiah's prophecy and in fact wanted it to come true since it would be better than the coming destruction. But since Hananiah was offended, since he knew he did not get his message from God, he had to double down and tried to use Jeremiah's symbolism for his own benefit. So that's what's happening here. Hananiah knows Jeremiah is not arguing and fighting against him. He's not going, no, you're wrong, you're false, no, that's bad. Jeremiah's going, look, I like what you said, Hananiah, and I hope it comes true. But it probably won't. But we're going to see in about two years. So Hananiah knows his words did not come from God. And so he's doubling down on his words, basically. So he breaks the yoke, and then he says, here in verse 11, And Hananiah spake in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck, of all nations within the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. So that's what has happened basically right there. Now here's what's interesting. Hananiah previously had spoke and said that he had broken. So let's see, he said, where to go? Uh, oh, he says, I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. And then he reiterates that again, that I will break the yoke. So two full years. So Hananiah is going, fine, we're going to see in two full years. I'm going to use your own symbolism against you and use it in my favor, basically, by breaking the yoke to symbolize that God told me the yoke will be broken. And that's what's happening here. So sometimes people put deadlines on their prophecies because it makes it sound more real. You can't, you know, it's hard if you think about it, it's hard to be a prophet to say, someday this will come true, at some point it'll come true. That's hard to nail down. 
that's hard to build credibility on because there's no way of measuring it. So sometimes these prophets will say, I'm going to put an absolute measurement on it because it makes it sound more absolute, makes it sound more concrete. That's what Hananiah did. He put a date to make it sound more legit. That sometimes will happen. Uh, oftentimes it does backfire, though, because it doesn't come true. Now, Jeremiah was not afraid, again, of the false prophecy. He didn't argue against Hananiah. He hoped that Hananiah would be right, in fact, because he knows the truth. The truth is, I want prosperity for my people. I don't want to go through the, the wars and destruction that's coming. I want that. But that's probably not what's going to happen. That was his message. So now the people have this choice to follow. Who do we follow, basically? So verse 12, Then the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the prophet, after that Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah. So this is now a new revelation that Jeremiah is getting after that. And it's telling him, God is telling him, Go tell Hananiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Thou hast broken the yokes of wood, but thou shalt make for them yokes of iron. So here's the interesting thing. This is now God doubling down on Hananiah's doubling down. So Jeremiah now walks up to Hananiah and says, Hey, Hananiah, God wants me to tell you that while you can break a yoke of wood, the punishment that is coming will be a yoke of iron, something you cannot break. It's going to be bad. That's It's going to be much stronger. It's going to be way bad. You're not going to be able to just simply break it. So there's God's ratcheting it up even a little bit more, basically. And he's continuing on, verse 14, For thus saith the Lord of God, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron upon the neck of all these nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And they shall serve him, and I have given him the beasts of the field also. So he's going, you can, you can break the symbolic yoke that was wood, but the real yoke is iron. You won't be able to break that. You're not going to have it work out. Basically, God's not going to do what Hananiah said. Now, verse 15, Then said the prophet Jeremiah unto Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee, but thou makest his people to trust in a lie. So Jeremiah is calling Hananiah out straight on that one right there. So verse 16, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will cast thee from off the face of the earth. This year... Thou shalt die, because thou hast taught rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah's prophecy had a two-year time frame to come to fruition. Jeremiah now added another prophecy and said, This year you are going to die. Verse 17, So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. So God had Jeremiah prophesy the death of Hananiah with a time frame on it. This makes it harder to deny when it comes to pass. So the old, people didn't have to wait the two years to see if Hananiah was right. They just waited within the year, and Jeremiah's prophecy that Hananiah would die was proven right. Which means you should probably listen to the other things Jeremiah has said. That's what it comes down to. But So this gave ability for the people to test the prophets, basically. Now, here's the thing, though. Jeremiah was proven correct. Did the people then follow? They didn't. They didn't follow his advice. Uh, I think, you know, in my mind, this is a tribute to the stubbornness of the people. This is the challenge. Like we've talked about a lot, people have a tendency to learn something that is true and then spend the rest of their life defending it. Rather than saying, maybe what I know isn't all the truth. Maybe there's more for me to learn. That's not what they're saying. They take this little bit of truth they learned, and then they're going to fight to the death to prove it's true. Everything else is all about justifying that this is right, that I am right. And that's not how we learn truth. We learn truth by admitting we could be wrong, and we need to spend more time studying and getting close to Christ having his spirit with us, basically. The beauty is, is if you have the spirit of God with you, you can find a true prophet quickly because you can feel, is what this prophet's saying helping me feel the spirit of Christ? If I feel the spirit of Christ around him, I'm accepting this, I'm understanding it in an objective, 
way, then this will work. If I'm, if I'm saying this doesn't jive with the way I was taught to follow God, so I'm not going to listen to it, that's not being open to the Spirit. That's the thing we have to, that's a hard part. That's the thing we have to really think about when we're learning, learning truth, learning anything really. So the challenge is, is once the people make up their mind, it's hard to convince them of changing it. Something must change them or cause them to look for change before they'll open up and look for possibilities. That's the challenge. I'm going to stay where I'm at. I, I see this in business all the time. I'm going to keep doing the same marketing I'm doing until that marketing basically dies. They just hope it doesn't die. But it eventually does. So now they've got to change tactics and start up over. Instead of going, oh, it's it's moving. We need to tweak what we're doing and keep it back up. They they don't want to change unless they have to. So people do this. They'll follow their same routes to and from work in their car unless they are blocked by road construction. Then they're forced to move and they hate it. If you read that book, the uh, Who Moved My Cheese? That's these people that they don't like it when the cheese is gone and they have to go out in the maze and find more. They don't want the unknown. They want it given to them. And that's what these people are dealing with, basically, is they don't want to change. They don't want to change. But all of this with Jeremiah and Hananiah and things gives them choice. And now they have the choice where they can change. But their choice is not to change. And that's why we're going to see the destruction and what's going to happen. Uh, now, what's interesting in verse 17, about verse 17 is when, about Hananiah, Deuteronomy 18.20 tells us that prophesying falsely was a capital offense in the law of Moses. Here's what's fascinating. The people tried to have Jeremiah killed for his prophecy, prophesying against the city. Because of that, probably because of what Deuteronomy said. But Hananiah was the real one that was telling the lie. And so he lost his life instead of Jeremiah. So interesting how kind of a poetic justice in there that turned out that uh, happened with that. So now let's jump over to chapter 29 as Jeremiah is going to continue the prophecy of what's going to happen to these people when, they, when all this comes down, basically. So let's jump over there. 